This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Taking the bitter with the tweet. The CEO of Twitter is out after months of disappointing growth and growing pressure from investors. Let's go shopping. That's what people did in May as the latest retail sales number shows the all-powerful consumer hasn't forgotten how to spend. And nearing retirement, the one investment that some say is better than owning individual stocks. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, June 11th. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sharon Epperson. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Good evening from me as well, and welcome. Well, stocks rise on strong retail sales. More on that in a moment. But we begin with late-day developments from one of the most talked-about social media stocks, Twitter. Call it hashtag you're out. CEO Dick Costolo stepping down. Co-founder Jack Dorsey will come back, take over as interim chief executive. The change comes after months of pressure from investors and the inability to convince Wall Street that the company's growth strategy was working. The reaction in the stock market initially was positive, with the shares rising in after-hours trading. John Fort has our story. Twitter CEO Dick Costolo is out, and former CEO and executive chairman Jack Dorsey is now in. It's just the latest bit of turmoil for a company that's had a lot of shakeups in management. Ironically, it's a year to the day since Chief Operating Officer Ali Rogani uh, departed from the company, was really pushed out, and raises questions about the future of Twitter, uh, a company that's been criticized for not communicating as well as it might with Wall Street about the various metrics that should be used to judge the company's growth. It's been compared unfavorably uh, to Facebook, which has had steady growth in its core products and others it has picked up along the way. And Twitter, of course, just had a difficult report last quarter with uh, revenue and guidance coming in below expectations. The question is, what happens now under Jack Dorsey? Does he end up sticking around uh, as CEO, even though he's got another company square to run and didn't seem to be interested in the job? Those things have a way of happening. Does Twitter get sold uh, to a suitor like perhaps Google? All of those questions and all of those possibilities, sending the stock uh, up after hours as investors digested this news of a CEO shakeup and certainly a different path forward for Twitter. For Nightly Business Report, I'm John Ford. Now to those retail numbers that Tyler mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, which show that Americans stepped up their spending in May. Retail sales rose 1.2 percent last month, following a much smaller 0.2 percent gain in April. And when people are willing to spend, that's typically a sign they feel good about the economy and their own job prospects. Steve Leisman has more. The economy looks to be making a comeback as consumers, cocooned for most of the winter, seem to be spreading their wings. Retail sales rose strongly in May, with a surge in car sales and clothing, capping a month of better economic news that shows the economy rebounding decently from the contraction in the first quarter. We've had about a month now of better data on the economy. We got a good payroll number recently. We got good housing starts, uh, good auto sales, and now the broad retail sales report. You know, it had been a big mystery to economists why uh, retail sales had been so weak in recent months. And this kind of takes us a step closer to where I think we should be. Uh, the U.S. consumer hasn't forgotten how to shop. The latest data show an economy expanding at an above average 3.1 percent in the second quarter. A sharp turnaround from the half point contraction in the first. Low levels of claims for jobless insurance suggest the rosier employment picture should continue this month. Together with better wages, the data paint a picture of an economy with decent momentum, propelled by the previously absent consumer. I think there are some good signs on the economy for the back half as it relates to the consumer. The last couple of months have looked really good uh, in terms of wage inflation, and, and we're hearing these big companies out there raising wages, and I think all of that plays very well for the consumer. There's no guarantee the good news will continue. Gas prices have decidedly stopped falling, and some economic rebounds since the Great Recession ended have proven short-lived. But the Federal Reserve reported today that household net worth rose $1.6 trillion in the first quarter to a new record. There was solid growth in household stock market portfolios and in home values. That's another reason I think the consumer should be out there spending again in June. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Those retail sales numbers sent stocks higher early in the day, but then came word of a dramatic end to the meeting between Greece and its creditors when the International Monetary Fund, also known as the lender of last resort, walked out 
of those bailout talks, and that took the wind out of shares. By the close, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up just 38 points to 18,039. It had been up as much as 109. The Nasdaq finished the day higher by five, and the S&P 500 gained three. Michelle Caruso Cabrera has more now on the new Greek drama. Today, the International Monetary Fund walked out of Greek debt negotiations, saying the talks are going nowhere. The IMF says it's now up to the Greeks to come back to the table when they are willing to make some real changes. This most recent blow-up comes after a late-night meeting between the Greek leader Alexis Tsipras, the German leader Angela Merkel, and French President Francois Hollande, a meeting which led to nothing except a commitment to intensify the talks. Then today, Tsipras met with the head of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. Again, no deal. The clock is ticking. The Greeks need the last 7 billion euros in their current bailout program by June 30th if they're going to be able to pay back the IMF. They also needed to pay government workers and their pensioners. And any deal to get Greece the cash would have to be approved by various European parliaments. So this week is critical. A key sticking point in the negotiations, pensions. The lenders want the Greek government to force people to retire much later. That would lower pension costs. Thus far, though, the changes suggested by Athens aren't strict enough and don't take effect soon enough. If the Greeks don't get a deal by June 30th, they won't be able to meet all their obligations, and they'd likely default on the IMF, and they might not be able to pay their workers and their pensioners. Plus, the ECB could cut off credit to the Greek banks, which could, in fact, shut down the entire Greek banking system. That could grind the economy to a halt. Michelle Caruso Cabrera, Nightly Business Report. The World Bank is joining the IMF in its call for the Federal Reserve to hold off on raising interest rates until next year. The bank said that keeping rates at record lows would help avoid the kind of financial market volatility witnessed during the so-called taper tantrum back in 2013. The World Bank also cut its forecast for U.S. growth this year to 2.7 percent from 3.2 percent. The number of Americans who filed new claims for unemployment benefits rose slightly more than expected last week. Despite the rise, the number remains at a level that's consistent with the strengthening labor market. According to the Labor Department, initial claims increased 2,000 to a seasonally adjusted level 279,000. Change in the Murdoch media empire to tell you about is first reported by CNBC's David Faber. Rupert Murdoch is preparing now to step down as chief executive officer of 21st Century Fox. He will reportedly hand the title to his son, James. Rupert, the elder Murdoch, will stay on as chairman, and his older son, Lachlan, will take on the role of co-executive chairman. Rupert controls almost 40 percent of the voting shares at Fox through the Murdoch Family Trust. Shares of 21st Century Fox were off a fraction, as you see there. A massive train derailment and tanker car explosion back in 2013 hit a small town in Quebec very hard. Now, according to multiple reports, some big oil companies have contributed $345 million toward a fund to compensate victims of that disaster. The creation of the fund is not common, but there's a reason why the energy companies are doing it. Morgan Brennan has more. It's been almost two years since 47 people died in northeastern Canada, the result of a fiery derailment involving a train moving highly volatile crude oil from North Dakota's Bakken Shale Formation. Now, energy companies hoping to avoid expensive and lengthy litigation have agreed to pay into a $345 million fund for victims of the accident in Lac Megantic. The Wall Street Journal reports Royal Dutch Shell, Marathon Oil and ConocoPhillips and others have already contributed tens of millions of dollars. Train derailments are usually blamed on the railroad carrier, in this case, Montreal, Maine and Atlantic Railway. Following the accident, the company sought bankruptcy protection. Now, if the fund is approved by U.S. and Canadian courts, the energy companies would be shielded from a number of lawsuits claiming wrongful death and negligence. According to the report, Marathon Oil, based in Houston, said a decision to contribute did not constitute an acknowledgment of liability. And other companies involved have said their responsibility ended once the crude was pumped out of the ground and properly labeled. You have some companies who are trying to preempt, eliminate additional liability at a later date and they think they'll be positively viewed uh, if they can go back and say, look, we long ago uh, made contributions to help these victims of this horrible accident. Nearly one million barrels of oil are loaded onto trains each day in North America, even with the drop in crew car loads caused by lower oil prices. That's up 
from almost none before 2009. Since the accident in Canada, there have been almost a dozen others involving North Dakota crude, which is highly flammable, though none caused any fatalities. Railroads are usually targeted in derailment cases, but some U.S. officials have complained that companies could be doing more to make their oil safer by stripping out volatile gases before loading it onto trains. It all sets the stage for what could become the next legal and regulatory battleground for crude by rail, one that would require more safeguards on the product itself and hold not just railroads, but energy companies responsible as well. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. The IRS wants to fight tax-related fraud and protect taxpayers, and today the agency confirmed what many had expected. The agency will work alongside private tax preparation and software firms to share information and tighten security. The critical thing for taxpayers to know is that new protections will be in place by the time they have to file their taxes in 2016. Each of us will be making substantive changes through the summer and the fall to be ready for the next tax season. And this IRS matter isn't the only business-related issue on Washington's agenda today. There's also trade and reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. And Eamon Javers joins us now from Washington. Uh, but let's start with the IRS. Eamon, what are some of the protections the IRS is going for here? Hi, Tyler. This is all about protecting individual taxpayers. And as you say, the IRS is calling this a new era of cooperation between the U.S. government and tax preparers and also software firms that help uh, individual taxpayers file their taxes. What they say is they're doing a whole new series of, of technical items in order to help ensure that the IRS knows that this tax return that's coming in is actually a real tax return represented by a real tax payer out there in the universe. It's all about uh, plugging some of the holes that allowed for that massive hack attack against the IRS that we saw using the IRS's own website, Tyler. Eamon, there's also this big trade vote in the House that's scheduled for tomorrow, and actually President Obama seems to be on the same side as the GOP. What can we expect there? Well, we expect it's going to be close. This is the Trade Promotion Authority vote uh, that we're expecting in the House tomorrow. It, it's said to be close up there. There's a lot of cross-cutting politics right now. Unions are making a push against a trade adjustment agreement that might come to a vote uh, before the TPA vote tomorrow. But ultimately, uh, this is likely to pass. But uh, talk to me this time tomorrow, and we'll <laughs> see where we stand. Because those trade deals have become increasingly controversial here in Washington, with a lot of people saying uh, that they're killing American jobs and, and exporting jobs overseas. Trade makes a strange bedfellows of politicians, doesn't it, does, it Eamon? Yeah. Let's talk about the Export-Import Bank, another controversial one. The charter expires at the end of the month. Is the Senate expected to move on it? Yeah, the Senate is expected to move on it. Critics there call the Export-Import Bank crony capitalism, and there is at least a chance that for the first time in the 81-year history of the Export-Import Bank, uh, they might let its charter expire. Uh, but the betting now is that this has enough votes, based on the action in the Senate that's gone on this week, that they do have enough votes uh, to reinstate the Export-Import Bank. That, of course, benefits big American companies like Boeing by extending loan guarantees to foreign customers who are buying American exports. So that's an important one for a lot of big companies, Boeing and Caterpillar included. All right. Eamon Javers in Washington. Thank you. You bet. Still ahead, why soon-to-be retirees are piling into one type of investment, but do the risks outweigh the rewards? to your wallet, folks. Proposed rates for health insurance premiums uh, on some 2016 exchange plans are going to rise an average of almost 6 percent. This, uh, according to a study by the research firm Avalair Health, looked at seven states in the District of Columbia and focused on the silver plans, the mid-grade ones, basically. The study said the average silver plan's monthly premium proposed for 2016 was $448 compared with $423 this year. Tyler mortgage rates hit highs for the year this week as bond yields climbed. The latest data released by Freddie Mac shows the rate on the 30-year fixed mortgage is now a little above 4 percent. Since late April, the 30-year fixed rate has risen 39 basis points. 
Well, let's call this one the rise of the zombies. These are homes that are in foreclosure one way or another, but the bank hasn't repossessed it yet, and the homeowner, man, they're gone. Even as the housing market recovers, the number of these zombies is rising in some markets. Diana Olick explains. There are no zombies living in these houses, quite the opposite. They're empty, which is why they've been dubbed zombies themselves. Thousands of homes in the foreclosure process, but not yet repossessed by banks. Now, as home prices rise, banks are seeing dollar signs. They're speeding up all foreclosures and actually creating more zombies in high-priced markets. Now, finally, the bank is coming back with all their ducks in a row, the proper documentation, and the homeowner is seeing the writing on the wall that I'm going to have to leave and, and move on with my life. So while the overall foreclosure crisis has improved dramatically, the number of zombies is increasing in markets like New York, L.A., Houston, Philadelphia, and Boston. We looked at some of these zombies in D.C. and in Teaneck, New Jersey, home after home with estimated current values really quite high some at over half a million dollars. So once these homes clear the foreclosure process, they could present great deals for first time buyers as well as investors and flippers. That is welcome news to neighbors. We would love to have people move in and occupy the houses. Um, it seem, makes it seem a little unsafe or a little dreary when you're walking by and you see vacant signs and you don't know, you know, what's going on with the houses. But like everything else in real estate, it's all local. While some zombies are finding owner souls again, others are not moving at all because the neighborhood just hasn't recovered yet. There is a legacy of the foreclosure crisis that will be impacting certain neighborhoods um, for a very long period of time. Nationwide though, bank repossessions are ramping up now at a nearly two year high. The zombie apocalypse once again thwarted. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. To read more about zombie foreclosures, head to our website, nbr.com. The feud between Lululemon and its founder may be over soon, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The athletic apparel maker filed for Chip Wilson to sell his family's stake in the company. The sale could total 20 million shares, a 14% stake worth about $1.3 billion. The founder, who has fought with the board over its strategies, reportedly is weighing the option. Shares were off 1 percent to $66.07. The activist hedge fund Elliott Management has disclosed a 7 percent stake in Citrix, which is best known for its go-to-meeting service. The firm wants to work with the company on improving operations while also selling or spinning off corporate assets. Shares popped almost 7 percent to over $70, $70.39. The chip maker Integrated Silicon Solutions has struck a deal to be bought by China's Uphill Investments. This comes just a day after it had agreed to be bought by Cypress Semiconductor. The latest move in the bidding war values the firm at nearly $700 million. Shares of Integrated Silicon were 5 percent higher to 21.36. Cypress was off slightly to close at 13.06. Shares of Axivent surged after the company said its initial public offering raised $315 million. That's the largest amount ever raised by a biotech company going public. The firm preparing to start late-stage testing of an Alzheimer's disease drug treatment. Shares doubled. They closed at $29.90. And European regulators are taking aim at Amazon and General Electric. Separate aim. The European Commission has filed a, a formal probe into Amazon's e-book business to investigate whether the retailer used its dominant position in the market to favor its own products over rivals. Separately, European regulators are set to say that General Electric's deal to buy the energy unit of Francis Alstom could harm competition, this according to a Reuters report. Amazon up a fraction to 432.97. General Electric went the other way, falling by about 12 cents to 27.51. And we just want to draw your attention to a move in Eli Lilly. The pharmaceutical giant jumped in today's trading, but there doesn't seem to be any significant news causing the move. The shares popped to a 14-year high. They closed 4 percent higher on no news at 86.59. Investors who are nearing retirement are looking for income, and many are turning to multi-asset ETFs for their diversified exposure to stocks, bonds, commodities, and even risky high-yield areas like real estate investment trusts. But are these types of ETFs for everyone, and should they be in your portfolio? David Blanchett is the head of retirement research at Morningstar, and he joins us now. David, thank you for being here. 
Let me start by asking you about these multi-asset ETFs. Exactly what are they? What are the pros and cons of them? Well, a multi-asset ETF is really just an ETF for an exchange-traded fund that has different types of assets. So it's got a combination of things like stocks and bonds and real estate versus the more traditional ETFs are just usually just a single stock or single bond index. Now, you say that most investors may be better off choosing these multi-asset ETFs than individual stocks. Why, why would that be? You know, individual investors buying single stocks worries me because most people aren't, aren't great at timing the market or picking great investments. And so if you go with one of these multi-asset ETFs, you're buying a, a prepackaged solution created by investment professionals. So it's an easy one-off way to get exposure to different types of markets. But how do they compare, for example, with a plain vanilla balanced fund that has some stocks and some equities in it uh, or a target date fund that basically does the same thing? So, I mean, I think it depends on your goal. I think that, you know, one place where we've seen a lot of growth in the multi-asset ETF space is, is income ETFs. And these are ETFs that are focused on creating income. So they combine different high-yielding asset classes like high-yield bonds, uh, infrastructure, uh, commodities, preferred stocks, and do a single option for retirees. What do investors need to know about any of the volatility in these ETFs and the multi-asset ETFs? Some of them don't have a lot of assets in them. They have grown as a group, but some of the individual names may not be ones that have a lot of liquidity. Is that a concern? It is. I mean, the, the multi-asset ETF space is very small. It's only about 0.4% of the total assets in ETFs today. And I think that if you look at the difference in these, in these ETFs, there's a huge dispersion. I mean, some are, are almost all bond-like, some are all stock-like. And within that, there's some big differences in risk as well. What's their track record, David? Well, so it's a relatively new space. You know, the average multi-asset ETF has only been around about three years, and so there really isn't a lot of history there. Now, most of these are based upon indexes that may have 10-year histories. And one problem with the histories, though, is it's been back-tested. It's not actual history of the ETF. But, but for the three-year period, what kind of returns uh, have, have they been delivering to investors? It, it varies significantly. I think that the one thing they have been good at is, is creating income. You've got yields on some of these as high as 6%, where if you're an income-focused investor, that's a lot more than you get today, for example, buying bonds. That is certainly a lot of income for a lot of folks out there who need it very badly right now. David Blanchett, thank you very much with Morningstar. Thanks for having me. And you bet. Coming up, can a one-make, one-model car rental startup take the headache out of renting a car? Here's what to watch tomorrow. The producer price index, an important inflation indicator, is out. Also a report on consumer sentiment. And that's what to watch Friday. Boeing hiked its 20-year forecast for aircraft demand, saying 40 percent of new jets will feed Asia's travel boom. But the plane maker shaved its prediction for annual airline traffic growth because of falling oil prices. Still, shares were up at Boeing today by about 1 percent at 142.96. Good news for the flyers out there, too. The Department of Transportation's latest airline card report shows that more flights were on time and fewer were canceled in April. The best carriers for on-time arrivals were Hawaiian, Alaskan, and Delta. The worst were Frontier, Spirit, and the regional carrier, Envoy. Well, if you're like many people, renting a car can sometimes be a trying experience. Long waits, mistakes with vehicles being reserved, they're common complaints. Now, a new company is trying a new approach to renting cars, and Phil LeBeau has the story of Silver Car. Steven Richardson travels more than 300 days a year. After repeated problems getting vehicles or feeling nickel and dimed by rental car companies, Richardson hit his breaking point. I, I was incredibly frustrated. It was painful. I would actually go out of my way to try to find public transportation or other rides just so that I wouldn't have to rent from the big rental companies. Richardson no longer rents from Hertz, Avis, or Enterprise. Instead, he rents from Silvercar, an Austin, Texas startup founded three years ago by Luke Schneider. We thought that we could take a page from some pretty successful travel companies uh, and create a company with a very simple model, a single make and model of car uh, and an entirely mobile user experience. Silver Car rents only silver Audi A4s. Using a mobile app, customers make reservations to get a car, 
either at a spot just outside the airport or in some locations, Silver Car picks you up at the curb. The goal? Get you in a car quickly with no surprises. There is always consistency. You're only going to get one kind of car, and it's a great car every time. While there are plenty of complaints about established rental car companies, breaking their dominance won't be easy. Many travelers have to use them because of corporate accounts, and their locations at airports are convenient, making it tougher for startups. When I look at Silver Car, the biggest hurdle beyond getting just the brand out there is going to be convincing people to take their way to get to the Silver Car lots versus the buses they're used to. For Steven Richardson, Silver Car is the silver lining to his rental car nightmares. I, I like the idea that I know the car I'm going to get. It's the same car consistently every time. These Audis here at Silver Car's latest location near O'Hare Airport means the startup company has set up operations at 10 airports around the country with plans to add two or three more before the end of the year as Silver Car tries to redefine the way America rents cars. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Might be worth a try. I would definitely want to try Might that. be worth a try. Definitely. Sounds I like good. those Silver Cars. Well, that's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sharon Epperson. Thanks so much for watching. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll hope to see you right back here tomorrow night.